Welcome to the Sonosite webinar on ultrasound guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit, the next chapter. Uh, my name is Chris Pennell, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, please be advised that all attendees are muted. Uh, you can type your questions at any time into the Q&A box in the toolbar located at the bottom or the side of your screen, and we'll be getting to those questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but you can ask those questions anytime during the presentation if you'd like. And this webinar will be recorded and archived for future reference. Uh, so here with us today is Adrian Barrett. Uh, since graduating with a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 1995, Adrian has been focused on caring for dialysis patients for the last 27 years. Her scope of influence on successful hemodialysis practices has expanded over the years through her evolving roles in education and provincial policy initiatives. Adrian is currently the body access slash independent dialysis nurse for the Health Sciences North Nephrology Program in Sudbury, Ontario, where she contributes to a multidisciplinary patient-centered care team. And part of her responsibilities include knowledge sharing at symposia, conferences, and workshops, and contributing to task groups for the Ontario Renal Network. Adrienne is also CNF certified, which is a Canadian nurse certification in nephrology. Adrienne, we're super excited to have you here, so I'll go ahead and turn it on over to you. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking the time for attending this webinar. I'm going to assume you're attending it because you're interested in consolidating your skills related to ultrasound guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit. So without much further ado, let us begin. As Chris mentioned, if you have any questions, please go ahead and write them in the chat, chat section and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. All right, as it stands, existing challenges to ultrasound use in the hemodialysis unit. Let's review what some of those challenges might be. Ultrasound guided cannulation is a fairly new practice in dialysis units. And as a result, there's not a lot of robust information out there that individuals can access to help guide them along this process of learning this new skill set. Creating this webinar is as an opportunity to create one more of those resources that will hopefully help you. Help you. What I've done here is I've taken some barriers that have been identified by myself and other individuals in my role um, that I network with, and I thought it would be prudent to address what those potential challenges could be because they might relate to you as you're watching. So first of all, a lot of times people say, I don't know how to use the ultrasound. That makes sense. This is a fairly new device, and it's not something that you might have been trained to use if your training has occurred a while ago or if your program is just accepting these devices as part of their system or something they're thinking about doing. I don't know what I'm looking at. And that means on the screen, you've got your probe, you've got your image on an ultrasound screen, and you're not quite sure what to identify what you're looking at. Using the ultrasound takes time. I don't have any time to spare. Well, you know what? I can understand. Um, workloads in healthcare are continuing to increase. And that means that our time is ever more precious. But let me just say when it comes to using the ultrasound that while it might take time to consolidate this skill, it certainly does save you a lot of time in the future and with any cannulations because our number one objective when we're cannulating our patients is not to miss. And it would be nice to have a skill set that would help us not miss. Ultrasound can do that. It's awkward to use and it stresses me out. That's perhaps the most predominant one I hear. And you know what? It is awkward to use if you're not used to it. And it can stress you out because you don't know how to use it or you don't understand what you're looking at or you're having a problem moving around. We'll address some of this uh, throughout the webinar. Why can't I see the cannula in situ when I check for placement? Hard time locating that cannula. We'll talk about ways to possibly rectify that situation. And how do I stabilize the vein when I'm using the ultrasound? Good point. We'll address that too. I cannulate well without it and the patient doesn't want me to use it. Well, okay, we will address those issues too as well. Essentially, the learning objectives of today's webinar are why is the use of ultrasound guided cannulation considered beneficial? Two, rolling out an educational plan in your facility related to ultrasound guided cannulation and acknowledging the barriers that may need to be overcome. We'll do a brief overview of how to use the ultrasound for guided cannulation, specifically walking it in. And we're gonna review some images, identifying issues with an AV fistula or graft using an ultrasound. We'll do some case studies. 
things that might help you be that might help you identify what you're seeing on the ultrasound screen. Okay, so let's start with why is the ultrasound guided cannulation a benefit? Well, it has the potential to decrease interstitial events during cannulation. And this can potentially reduce the stress for both the hemodialysis patient as well as the nurse. And frankly, if at any point during my working day, I can have a reduction of the stress I might be feeling, I'm going to be willing to adopt whatever it takes to get there. It can provide more accurate cannulation than non-guided cannulation, although admittedly, it might take a little bit more time. It can ad help identify when a vessel is ready for cannulation, acceptable depth and diameter of that vessel. So we all know when we're waiting for a fistula to mature, we're waiting for it to reach the rule of sixes. And one of those is um, the, the vessel itself should be no more than six millimeters below the surface of the skin. And the diameter of the vessel should be about um, six millimeters as well. Well, we can't possibly know the depth or vessel diameter without the use of something like an ultrasound that can help us to identify when a vessel's ready and mature for cannulation. It can assist the bedside nurse in identifying the presence of valves, thrombus, aneurysms, areas of injury, pseudoaneurysms, and vessel branches. All of these things we're going to take a look at. I always make sure that when I make statements like this, a lot of it is backed up with existing research. And so you will notice on the bottom of this slide that the articles that I refer to do support the statements made as to why cannulation with ultrasound is a benefit. If you're going to be using ultrasound in your unit, what should an educational rollout of it look like? Well, always keep in mind that ultrasound in the dialysis unit is not being used as a diagnostic tool. It's being used as a tool to assist with cannulation. So do not expect that you should have to develop the skill set that a sonographer or ultrasound tech has. You're a bedside nurse and you're using this to assist you in cannulating in a patient's dialysis access. Help determine which healthcare professionals we expect expected to use this tool and who's responsible for using it. Guidelines on how to do this do not yet exist. Existing guidelines make recommendations for the use of ultrasound guided cannulation, but as I had mentioned in a previous webinar, there needs to be more research on this particular topic in order for it to be um, adopted as a guideline. We're well on our way to getting there, but in the meantime, using the existing research that we have and moving forward and potentially doing new research is something that will only assist in this endeavor. If you're starting from scratch, more and more information is becoming available as it relates to ultrasound guided cannulation. There are two articles that I reference here. One of them comes from um, Rosa Martikarina et al. And it is a development of competencies to, use, to the use of bedside ultrasound assessment and cannulation. It gives you a really good idea of potentially what you can do to structure your educational rollout if you're having problems uh, trying to determine where to begin. And then the other resource is one of my favorites and it's BC Renal. They have uh, their guidelines, the recommendations and standards online and they have some excellent references as it comes to ultrasound use in the hemodialysis unit that you might be interested in looking at. So starting out. Ultrasound might be new to you, so make sure you complete your program's education related to ultrasound guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit. I think at this point, you need to be aware that Sonocyte has an existing educational guide as well as recorded webcasts to assist in this endeavor. You can access this. It was a uh, webcast called Behind the Scan to See Is to Know. It was from November 2020, and that's the first of this series. This particular webcast is a continuation of that one, expanding upon information that was given there. It is, gives you more of a robust overview of the guidelines and um, existing research, a uh, review of why using, it, why using that is a, using ultrasound is a good idea, and it goes over the basics of ultrasound. You can also access the guided cannulation and dialysis court that's online on the Sonocyte Institute. And it's uh, um, used to introduce guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit with an online test. It's often recommended that you actually have your, your staff nurses complete this particular course before you start your education. It helps them to give, uh, give them a good foundation of knowledge. 
In addition to today's presentation, the assistance of your regional Sonosite clinical application specialist for education on the device itself can also enhance your education program. Uh, we, uh, we use Kristen and uh, she's an invaluable resource for both myself and all my bedside nurses. Familiarize yourself with the device in your unit, how to turn it off and on, because while I'm talking about Sonosite ultrasounds, there's a few different models and some of the uses, buttons, touch screens may or may not be available on the model that you have. Familiarize, oh, engage in a simulation learning if at all possible. So that means the use of blue phantoms or artificial limbs with dialysis accesses embedded in them. Use of your facilities infection control standards when using this equipment must always be forefront in your mind um, and please follow those policies and procedures. If you're using the ultrasound on a patient for the first time, make sure you tell them why you're using this equipment. Okay, so when it comes to learning to adopt ultrasound, I'm going to assume you're watching this webinar because you are interested in learning, but you might have evidence of other individuals in your unit who are not interested in adopting this particular skill set, and there's a lot of pushback on it. There's a lot of reasons why that might be happening. Here's, here's a few I'm going to go over. Someone might say, I cannulate well without it. The access pressures on the dialysis machine suggest I don't have issues with cannulation, so what's the point of using it? Well, studies suggest that cannula placement is um, the cent uh, cannula placement in the center of the vessel is only achieved 10% of the time when somebody cannulates. If you have accesses that are not challenging or a skill set check second to none, consider it using it for assessing maturing accesses. So if you really feel you don't need it for cannulation, it can still be a vital tool for you to use. And it's also a nice tool to have when a complicated access does eventually present in front of you. Having a consolidated skill set on how to use it in such a circumstance is invaluable. The patient doesn't want me to use it. If the patient has encountered unpleasant experiences with someone else who's used this device, their comment might very well be founded. I think it's worthwhile to determine where their anxieties come from and address them high anxiety or stress. And this is either on the side of the patient or the individual using the ultrasound, the nurse. If use of this device causes stress, practice with simulation beforehand. It's completely reasonable to consolidate this skill to a certain degree prior to even touching a live arm. I actually have embedded at the bottom of this particular slide, references to an article on how you can make your own homemade um, blue phantom to simulate using for cannulation. I have personally done this recipe and it has been very helpful. So if your program doesn't have access to a blue phantom, there, is, there are ways to produce one that can help you with simulation learning. And there is evidence that using simulation learning when learning how to do a skill set like this can uh, lead to certain competencies even before you even touch a live person. So that actually can really help to reduce your stress. There's no room. There's no room to put this ultrasound machine. Well, consider the fact that if the device becomes an invaluable tool in your own personal kit, you're going to make room for it because its value has proven its importance time and again. Let's start with some basics here. Holding the probe. So these are just little reminders I'm going to go over right now. When you hold the probe, one of the issues you can have is your objective is to get the vessel in the middle of the screen, to get that big black circle in the middle of the screen and for it to stay still. Holding the probe, sometimes you can experience a little bit of what I call drifting from side to side. That can happen because the probe, while well, you're usually using slippery ultrasound gel and it can move easily over the arm. If you take a certain part of your hand and you actually secure it against the patient arm, that can help to minimize that drifting that you experience. So the picture on the left depicts one of the ways that you can stabilize the ultrasound probe so that it does the image itself doesn't shift on you. When you're viewing the vessel with the ultrasound, there's two ways to view it. One is called the long axis view, and the other one is the short axis view, or longitudinal, longitudinal versus cross-sectional. What that essentially means is at the base of the probe, the ultrasound waves come out, but they only come out at about the thickness of a credit card. So you can look at a vessel two ways. You can look at it on the long axis, or you can turn the probe the other way and look at it on the 
short axis or the cross one. So for example, here's an example of a longitudinal view. The vessel itself is gonna look like a river flowing from one side of the screen to the other. This is a cross-sectional view. So this is like looking at the vessel being sliced. So knowing the difference between those two views can help you with orientation when you are using the ultrasound probe. The arrow on the probe follows your guideline or center line. And that's if you use the guideline or center line. I recommend that you always use the guideline. The dots on the guideline fall down the center of the screen and they always match up with the arrow that is on your probe. On a guideline, those dots have specific distances between each of them. So that'll help you determine the depth and the diameter of the vessel, which is important when you're trying to decide, am I approaching this from the usual angle? Is it a deeper access where I have to increase? Or is it a very shallow access where I have to decrease my angle of entry? The distance between that guideline is five millimeters or half a centimeter. And as you change the image depth, you're gonna change the distance of those uh, dots going down the center line. So the guideline is what I recommend, but the center line is also very helpful. All right, so this is a clip of using the ultrasound for access assessment. Someone has taken the probe and is running it up this individual's dialysis access. They're determining the depth and the diameter, and it's helping them to determine exactly where they're going to decide to put the cannulas when they put in the venous and arterial sites. So this is a basic way of using the ultrasound. If you can use it to assess, system, uh, uh, assess accesses on a go forward, it's going to help you consolidate the skill set, moving the probe, visualizing the screen. It'll help you consolidate that skill set. Here we have an example of exactly what a fistula looks like when it's captured on a cross-sectional view with your ultrasound. Usually it's gonna present as a nice big circle, at least five millimeters in diameter. Recognize that if you're not seeing it as a circle and it's a fistula that you're looking at, you might be putting a lot of pressure on that probe and compressing it. So make sure to use a feather touch whenever you use your ultrasound probe. Here is the double wall of an AV graft. PTFE graft, polytetrafluoroethylene. It's interesting, but this is a fairly pristine graft and it shows up quite clearly as a double wall. So that's how you would tell the difference between a fistula and a graft. Your graft shows up as a double walled vessel. All right, so you're ready to go. You're gonna start using the ultrasound for guided cannulation. The first thing you're gonna do at the bedside is you're gonna acknowledge your physical comfort. Adjust the chair or the bed the patient is going to be resting in to a height that is comfortable for you. Hunching over and cannulating is one of the many things that dialysis nurses do. That's not good body mechanics. I don't think we can recognize how being in an uncomfortable physical uh, position can increase our physical stress. So make sure that you're not putting any undue stress on your back or your joints when you're cannulating and try to move the equipment around so that you have the most comfortable ergonomic setup that you can have. Make sure your patient is comfortable. Guess what can happen when an individual is in a relaxed state? Vasodilation. Vasodilation means that that vessel, it's going to get as big as it can possibly be, and it's going to be a bigger target for us to hit. So not only does your physical comfort matter, but your patient's physical comfort matters. Let them adjust and get comfortable in the chair or a bed and get the, everything ready to go, nice and comfortable, and then proceed. If you have the luxury of accessing a mentor to coach you through the process, if this whole new skill set is something that uh, causes stress for you, access that mentor, have them coach over your shoulder. You might decide to say to them, okay, so I'm going to do this. Could you let me know when I'm doing something wrong? Or you might say to them, could you just observe while I do it? And then at the end of it, let me know what I could have done better. Or you can say something like, can you coach me the whole time? Tell me what my next steps are. Say things out loud with this mentor so that they know how they can be of assistance to you. Acknowledge it can take up to 500 cannulations with ultrasound to become moderately proficient. That's a lot of cannulations, but when you think about how many you do in a year's time, it's not even, it's much more than that. So if you take the time to use it on a regular basis, it won't be long before you will be starting to build up experience with using it with your patients. 
set up the equipment to facilitate comfort when in use. So oftentimes it can be, hey, there's no room for this. Yeah, you know what? I have to agree with you, dialysis units, there's a lot of compressed things happening in one space. It does mean when you want to put the ultrasound in the ideal position that you have to move equipment. I personally like to be able to look at the ultrasound screen without putting a lot of undue stress, straining my neck, twisting to have to look at it. So what I like to do is I have the patient in front of me. I try to put the ultrasound behind their shoulder like this picture depicts. Sometimes the patient is actually very interested in what's going on and they want to see it too. I just move the ultrasound over to a little bit a little bit, have them move their arm over so that I'm facing it better. So always pay attention to where the equipment is. If it's in a place that's easy for you to see, it's going to keep you more relaxed. Relax. When you get to the bedside, it's important to always relax. Here is a picture of a nurse who came home from a nice long day at work and decided to watch TV, fell asleep with her puppy. Okay, yeah, maybe not that relaxed, but when you get to the bedside, Taking a few deep breaths and trying to think of pleasant things can actually help you with your stress level. If you present at the bedside with an undue amount of stress, what makes you think that the patient can't pick that up immediately? They know a stressed nurse when they see one. There's a lot of things happening in our world and there could be a lot of things happening during your workday. Some days go way better than others. It's okay to be stressed. I'm just telling you to acknowledge it and try to do the little self-care things that will help you dissipate. Deep breaths, relax the shoulder, move forward. All right, so now we're gonna start with the process of how we actually cannulate using ultrasound guidance. This is going to be a condensed version of what was shared with you in the first webinar. We're gonna talk about walking it in using the cross-sectional method. The biggest issue I see with individuals who are trying to adopt this skill is having the capacity to know at all times exactly where the tip of the cannula is located. When you have a cannula underneath the ultrasound probe, the only way you can know that you're going looking at the tip is if you go past the cannula. So when you cannulate, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna line up your image and you're going to take your cannula and watching the arm and the probe, you're gonna cannulate into the arm. When you feel that that cannula has gotten underneath the probe into the sound waves, you're gonna turn your head and look at the ultrasound and you should see a bright white spot. Then you're gonna make small movements with both the probe and the cannula because you want to be assured that you're looking at the tip of the cannula. You're going to move your probe past the cannula. So now the cannula is no longer visible in, your, in the screen of your ultrasound machine. Okay, so then you're gonna move the cannula forward so that that bright white dot, which is what the cannula looks like, shows up in the middle of the vessel again. And then you're gonna repeat that process. The movements you are making will be very small very small, fractions of an inch, only millimeters of distance for both the probe and the cannula. So what I expect to happen when you cannulate, even though we only have an inch to work with when it comes to a cannula, you're gonna break that inch down into eight sections. You're gonna put it in the vessel and then you're gonna move very slowly one at a time and walk it in, keeping the tip of the cannula in the center of the vessel. So always know where that tip is located. So you move the cannula forward, you move the probe forward. You move the cannula forward, you move the probe forward. Here's a short video clip of what walking it in from a cross-sectional view looks like. You will notice that that cannula shows up as a bright white spot in the middle of the black vessel. And what I am doing is I'm moving the probe forward until I lose sight of that cannula. And then I bring in the cannula back into the field of view until I have no more cannula to cannulate. I am then assured that I've got the device in the right area and it's going to function as well as it possibly can. Here's another example of walking it in. You'll notice in this circumstance, so I have a tremendous amount of gel that I'm using um, before I put my probe cover on, on. Our program uses probe covers on our ultrasound. It's part of, part of our infection control. 
And um, that's what you're seeing here. So the surface of the skin is actually lower than what it is. It's at the first dot as opposed to the top of the screen. But that's another example of what walking it in using a cross-sectional view might look like if you're using the ultrasound. Okay, here's a good question. What do we do about a vessel that moves around? Well, you'll notice on the image on the left, this is usually approximately the hand setup you might have if you're cannulating without ultrasound. You've got one hand to stabilize the vessel, especially if it's a roly-poly one, and the other one's got the cannula. So you're able to hold things still while you move forward. You no longer have the luxury of having that hand to hold the vessel clear or hold the vessel in place when you're cannulating if you're using an ultrasound machine. That's now holding the probe. So what should you do? I recommend with fistulas in particular to use a tourniquet. This is something that's already embedded in vascular guidelines from KDOKI and Canadian and other global guidelines that exist. And I do recommend using it. On the right here is an example of a reusable tourniquet that we would give to our self-care patients. So it's the same patient using that all the time and our disposable tourniquets that we would use on fistulas. What will happen is, is that uh, using a tourniquet will help the vessel to become engorged. And if it's engorged, it has less of an opportunity to roll around. But remember, you're also now using a device that it, it tells you exactly where the vessel has rolled to and exactly where your cannula is. So if you do have a vessel that tends to move around, having the ultrasound, it allows you to know where it's gone and how to correct to get the cannula in there. Small movements and directional corrections will help to compensate for that. I also tell people that let's say you have an access in the forearm and you're using a tourniquet, don't put it too far up the arm because it's not going to have the engorgement uh, effect that you might want it to have. Bring it closer to the access, but not so close that your vessel appears to be compressed because the tourniquet is too close to your insertion site. Engorging the vessel with a tourniquet will help stabilize it. All right, so we talked about the basics of, uh, of cannulating with ultrasound. I'm assuming that you here might have some experience with it, but what you're looking for is more information. In particular, what am I looking at when I use the ultrasound? There's a variety of things that you should be able to identify when using the ultrasound for guided cannulation. And a few of those things are determining the difference between a vein and an artery, what a thrombus might look like, hematoma or injury to the tissues, valves within our vessels, areas of injury to the tissues, uh, cannula, what does it look like when it's in place, branching vessels or collaterals on our existing fistulas, using color Doppler and what that could mean, something called artifact, and that's just to name a few things. So let's review some images about cases that I've come across and questions that I've had about what am I looking at here. So first of all, we're going to determine the difference between a vein and an artery. They look very much alike insofar as they're both round black circles. So in this particular circumstance, what you're looking at is a fistula that has actually, not surprisingly, a little bit of injury to the anterior or top wall. Underneath that fistula is another vessel that is smaller. It's only a few millimeters away and it's pulsatile. That is the patient's artery. Now, it's deep enough that you may not hit it with a cannula, but if you were approaching this access and using a very steep angle of entry, there's a small chance that you inadvertently cannulate that artery. And we all know we don't want that to happen when we're cannulating. We wouldn't have known that this artery was there because it wouldn't be palpable below the vein. The ultrasound machine allowed us to identify its presence. And this is actually going to help us dictate where we're going to cannulate. In this circumstance, I would recommend not inserting a cannula in this area, just to be on the safe side. You don't want to inadvertently miss and puncture the artery. Uh, this is another video clip of a vessel that travels underneath a fistula. So it's not running in parallel with it, but it's running underneath. And it happens to be an artery as well. And you'll notice in this particular clip that this vessel is very close to the fistula, but only for a small section of the whole fistula itself. But it's nice to know that it's there because once again, if I was picking areas to cannulate, I wouldn't pick the exact section where the artery is just below the fistula in this circumstance. 
Another thing that's uh, good to know between arteries and veins is that when you push down using the probe, uh, uh, a vein, which is our fistula is made up, it might collapse, but the artery, because it has higher pressure in it, tends to stay round. So that's another way that it can help you identify the difference between the two. Now, let's talk about thrombus or clots. One of the things that I think we're all aware of is whenever we have an interstitial event with patient, uh, it leads to injury. Injury inside the vessel, injury outside of the vessel. And sometimes that damage to the vessel wall leads to the formation of a clot or a thrombus. Now, surprisingly, with the use of ultrasound, I've been able to determine that in some circumstances, even with a clot formation, if you leave that access and you assess it the next time they present for dialysis treatment, sometimes that thrombus has spontaneously resolved. It is no longer there, but sometimes it continues to be there. This is an important piece of information, especially if your program does declotting of accesses. Your nephrologist might wanna know, okay, when did this potential clot form? How long has it been in place? Because that can dictate the plan of care on a go forward basis. Sometimes after a patient has had an interstitial event, you might go to cannulate and you're having issues. You're not getting flows. And it might be because you're cannulating in an area where a thrombus formation is. Having the ultrasound allows you to actually identify something there. Using the ultrasound to assess an access, one treatment after it's had an interstitial event can be very helpful. It can allow you to avoid the areas of thrombus that you might come across. So here's an example, a clip of a fistula that has a couple of thrombus in it. So this is a upper arm access that the probe is being moved from the uh, elbow to the shoulder. And this individual had an interstitial event, um, the previous dialysis treatment, and they had two areas where the thrombus formed. So essentially, a thrombus looks like a gray area in the black circle, and it can present in any number of shapes, sizes, in the middle, on the wall. Being able to identify when it's there is helpful. There's a small thrombus here that you see on the right-hand side of the vessel on the inside. It's stuck to the vessel wall. It's very small, but it's moving there. Here's another thrombus formation. You can see that these accesses remain patent. So it's just a question of what to do about it. If you're able to even identify it's there, then you can call in your vascular nurse or your nephrologist, your interventional nephrologist, your interventional radiologist to have a discussion about what this means and what should you do with the access on a go forward. All right, so in this circumstance, there was some question as to whether or not this individual had a clotted access. This nurse took a video clip and asked me to go look at the video of the Doppler. So what we see here is a little bit of color outside of the vessel itself. And that's a little bit of artifact that happens. Moving the probe itself is producing the colors, but it's not indicative of a tremendous amount of flow in the access. Inside the vessel, which is round, there's a lot of gray area you'll notice that there is a very small amount of flow through here. So this access did have minimal patency, but it was pretty much clotted. We ended up uh, sending this individual for uh, angioplasty and declotting, which was successful. But if you're interested in learning exactly how to use the color Doppler with your ultrasound, I do recommend that you access your, your mentor, your educator, or the Sonocyte uh, uh, clinical application specialist to help you determine how to use that. So once again, here's a thrombus that's adhered to the vessel wall. There's another one. This is an older thrombus. This particular access was not functional anymore. The thrombus had been there long enough that our team decided that declotting was not an option. All right, let's talk about valves in the vessel. Knowing that all of our fistulas are made up of veins, it is possible that every now and again, we're gonna uh, find a, a valve. And more often than not, especially with say a venous cannulation, that's not gonna make much of a difference. But with an arterial cannulation that goes well, and then all of a sudden you don't get flows, you might wanna know, is there something in the vessel that's obstructing it? And it could be the presence of a valve. So knowing what they look like and being able to identify them can help. So here's a video clip of a metal cannula in a fistula, and you'll notice that there's a valve 
that's uh, happening here. So this particular uh, access, there was a small backwalling event. And you will notice that there's a bit of edema underneath that cannula and there's a narrowing of the vessel right where the cannula tip is sitting. The nurse wanted to know that she hadn't caused so much damage that she wasn't going to get flows and was surprised to find that there were valves located at the end of the cannula. So that's just a little interesting FYI. Hematoma, bruising, areas of injury. So this particular patient, I, I took a picture of the bruising that had occurred in her arm. She had an interstitial event in the previous dialysis treatment. And the left side is a video clip of that particular area of her access that's circled in red. You're gonna see here that she had the buildup of fluid around her vessel um, and it was still present the next dialysis treatment. It presented as firm tissue when it was palpated it was tender to the touch. And on the ultrasound image, it looks like pockets of fluid, collections of fluid. I like to say it looks like what uh, bodies of water would look like if you were up in a plane looking down. So those blackened areas are fluid collections, areas of either blood or serous, um, serous uh, fluid that has collected after an interstitial event. This is an interstitial event that resulted in injury to the anterior wall or top wall of this fistula. Getting an injury to the anterior wall can often happen if your cannula doesn't get all the way in and you're kind of scraping the vessel wall, it, it might become inflamed. You might get a little bit of uh, thrombus formation and edema, and this is what it would look like. Once again, this is an area of injury and this particular access is located on the left-hand side of the vessel. There's a little pocket of fluid that happened due to an interstitial event. The tip of this cannula just poked through the sidewall briefly causing this injury. All right, Teflon cannulas. Those are the plastic cannulas that you may or may not have experience using, but it's fascinating to know that you can actually see these quite nicely using the ultrasound. On the right here, I have an example of one. And these particular types of cannulas have blunt ends, flat ends. They also have holes, usually about four of them, that are located around the end of the cannula. One of the interesting things about these, this is that in order for the cannula to function maximally with the best possible flows during your treatment, you have to get not only the cannula in, but all four of those holes all the way into the vessel in order for it to function well. If you do a longitudinal view of your Teflon cannula after you've cannulated, you should be able to see those holes and determine if you have them all in the vessel. This is a little bit better image of such a Teflon catheter in place. And it looks like the cannula has been chewed on. It hasn't. That's a depiction of the holes. All four holes have made it into the vessel. So this particular cannula is optimally placed and did provide us with excellent flows during the dialysis treatment. Assessing with Doppler. Okay, once again, I do recommend that you get somebody to show you how to use the Doppler on your particular uh, device. Doppler allows you to determine if there's flow through the access, and that's what we use it for. Sometimes the patient might have an interstitial event, and we're unable to palpate a thrill because of the amount of edema that's located in the access. Using the color Doppler allows us to determine that there is flow. As I had said in the previous webinar, don't get confused with the varying colors you're going to see, blue, red, orange. That is simply the difference between blood flowing towards the probe and blood flowing away from the probe. A lot of our accesses are very high flow, have a lot of turbulence, and that's why you're going to see multiple colors. So this will allow you to determine if an access still has flows if you're questioning something like, I'm thinking this is clotted pulling out your ultrasound and using the color Doppler will help you to determine if there are if there is still patency in that vessel. Pseudoaneurysm. So I think we all know that an aneurysm is when a vessel wall becomes thinned and enlarged, and sometimes it can result in the outcropping or a bulging of the vessel in only one area. A pseudoaneurysm is different. That is when you have completely compromised the vessel wall. There's a hole in the vessel wall. And sometimes what happens is the tissue that surrounds the vessel starts to pouch out. So you're getting blood flowing into that pouch and back into the vessel. 
In this particular circumstance, this was a vintage graft and the patient presented with a bump that was new to them. Not surprisingly, the previous treatment, they had had an interstitial event. On the left-hand side, you're gonna see that that bump looks like, looks like it's a hole in the wall. But in order to confirm whether or not it was, I used colored Doppler and confirmed that yes, blood was flowing into and out of that outpouching, making it a pseudoaneurysm. The on-call nephrologist was uh, accessed and it was determined that um, a plan of care was made to address this particular issue. So this was good to know. The patient too was made aware and this patient having the cognitive ability to do so, I advised nurses to avoid that cannulation while we made the plan of care and, and had a plan of action. So color Doppler can be very helpful. Here's another example of an injured vessel wall, the anterior or top wall. Almost always we're gonna see injury to a uh, vessel wall after there's been a failed cannulation. You'll notice just to the top and the right of this particular image, there's a little pocket of fluid. So not only did we injure the vessel wall, but some of the blood from inside the vessel did leak out into the connective tissues. So that's what we're looking at here. This is an even bigger injured vessel wall, the anterior wall, somebody back walled quite uh, impressively. So not only did we get a leaking of blood into the tissues underneath it, but the thrombus formation and inflammation of the vessel wall occurred. We still had patency of the access. We were able to use it on and go forward because it did resolve in between dialysis treatments, but we definitely chose not to use this area for cannulation until it, it the injury um, cleared up. This is another example of injury to a vessel wall. The top right hand, top left hand side rather here is injured. Interstitial event again. Once again, top wall due to injury. Now, let's talk about the longitudinal view of this sharp cannula with an example of artifact. In this particular circumstance, that cannula is really easy to see, and it's obviously in a graft right there, but there appears to be some kind of echo effect that happens after the probe, and that can confuse you, um, uh, it happens after the cannula actually, that can confuse you in determining exactly where the cannula is. The presence of that artifact is normal. You are and occasionally will experience it, especially with a metal needle from which the sound waves bounce off very easily. So they might bounce back and forth causing this artifact. And like I said, you can see here that this is the double wall of a graft. Using the calipers is a very handy thing to have, especially if you are tracking the maturation of a newly created fistula and you wanna know that the diameter is increasing to the point where it's gonna be easy to cannulate it. So using the calipers, that's something that your mentor or your clinical educator or your sonocyte individual can help you determine how to use. In this particular circumstance, it was used to measure the um, diameter of the vessel. And you'll notice on the bottom left-hand side there, it gives you the exact measurement of the diameter of the vessel. This one was almost ready to use. This particular access was somebody who was uh, assessed in our pre-dialysis clinic. And we're waiting to see if we could start dialysis and if their access was ready. Using the ultrasound to determine things like branches of vessels. Sometimes you'll have accesses that are maturing poorly. Sometimes that can be related to the presence of collaterals that are stealing blood from the fistula itself. Using the ultrasound will be able to uh, give you the opportunity to determine if there are vessel uh, branched vessels. And also if you're going to be cannulating somebody with multiple branches, you're going to want to avoid putting the cannula tip anywhere near where that branch occurs because there's increased turbulence. So this is another assessment of a vessel. Very nice, somebody took the video. You notice here, they got a little heavy with the probe as we moved up, compressing the vessel itself. But it looks like there's gray stuff in there. Adrian, is that, is that a clot? No, that's artifact. That's artifact because this particular nurse was very adept at moving the probe up quickly. And that quick movement of the probe led to that kind of confused, messy image there. So this was a fully patent access but we weren't looking at a thrombus here. We were just looking at some artifact from moving up so quickly. The probe not making full contact with the skin surface during assessment. You're gonna notice on the left-hand side, left-hand side, there's almost lines and blank and shadowing going on. And that's simply the probe not making full contact with the skin. Part of it was off the skin. 
And it also could be due to the fact that you're not using enough gel when you're using your ultrasound probe. So that's something when you see those lines down the side and you see blank spaces when you should see some gray stuff in there, then it could be just how your probe is, is uh, making contact with the skin. Here's vessel injury from a previous interstitial event. This, this individual presented with substantial bruising. You'll notice on the right-hand side of this vessel, there's a huge pocket of fluid right there. So my concern when I was looking at this particular access and this particular interstitial event is it was not clear to me if that was just a hematoma, a pocket of fluid, or if it was a pseudoaneurysm because it seemed awfully large. So I pulled out the color Doppler option on this. And I took a look at that area. This is the color Doppler directly over that pocket of fluid. There is no movement of the fluid in that pocket. So I was rest, I was assured that the vessel was fully patent and that remained an area of injury that just needed time to resolve. Here's another example of vessel wall injury. This is substantial injury all the way around, a small access that uh, had a large, um, interstitial events with impressive edema and bruising. And this is how it showed up. You'll take a look at that vessel. The vessel walls are not clearly delineated because they're uh, like what I call angry. Um, they're edematous, they're injured. And this access it needed a rest before we could use it again. Thankfully, in this circumstance, this person had a dual access and we relied on their central venous catheter until all of this injury was able to resolve over time. Recognizing that the time it takes to resolve this injury is variable between people. It can be a week to two weeks, all depends on your person. Another example of a vessel wall that's not clearly delineated with obvious damage on the anterior portion of it. Yet another example, you're going to think we're terrible in my program, all these interstitial events. No, that was just me taking advantage of properly assessing. Not only was there a large interstitial event, but there was a substantial amount of thrombus formation inside this particular vessel. This patient needed to be um, scheduled for a declotting of our access. We did not have success declotting this access when they presented in the radiology department where we do our declots. The thrombus was even more extensive and could not be resolved. So this individual ended up getting a central venous catheter. Here's a longitudinal view of a vintage fistula. This is what it looks like after multiple cannulations. There were no areas of injury, bruising, or edema on this access. I just thought it would be a good example to show you of what a vintage fistula looks like. This particular vintage, the fistula was 12 years of age. Here's walking it in using the longitudinal view. That's something that a lot of people um, might originally try to do. I like the cross-sectional walking it in. This particular use of the longitudinal view might be a bit challenging for some individuals. And there's a lot of reasons why not getting an optimal longitudinal view is hard. So in this circumstance there, you see the, you see the cannula and you're able to um, continue your cannulation without backwalling. That was easy because that particular access was very straight. This particular one is a damaged access where we had limited capacity to cannulate. You'll see that the uh, interstitial event was on the right-hand side. So we were using ultrasound um, to ensure that we had good cannula placement. And this, um, lots of corrections and direction needed to happen here. And then when it was done, an attempt to get a good longitudinal view of this uh, uh, cannula in situ was had, but you see, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It wasn't clear and concise like the previous image was. And there's a reason for that. So if we were to look at these particular pictures here, the green line depicts the placement of the cannula in the vessel. Each one of these cannulas are uh, good enough for a good dialysis treatment. But if you put the probe over top, the one on the left here is nice and straight, and it would be easy to see a longitudinal view. The one in the middle, it's not. It's not easy to catch. You'll only catch a certain portion of the cannula, so you might see the whole vessel, but you'll only see a portion of the cannula. So you might get frustrated. How come this longitudinal view isn't working? And in the end, if you have 
a uh, fistula that has is very torturous with not a lot of straight sections, it might be extremely difficult to get a meaningful longitudinal view. And that's why I always recommend to use a cross-sectional view, especially if you have an access that isn't straight up the arm. And we all know those are becoming very limited. Here's a cross-sectional view of a stent in situ. Some programs use stents, others do not. Some programs say you can cannulate through a stent, others say you should not. But it's nice to be able to identify it so that you can follow your existing program policies and procedures when it comes to a stent. In general, stents are made up of the same uh, material as our PTFE graphs are, but they have an infrastructure like a scaffolding that's uh, almost like a wire that holds it all together. So that, therein lies the debate, cannulate or not cannulate. So in conclusion, I hope that this particular information I've shared with you today has allowed you to visualize a few more circumstances and be able to identify what they are. I think what you need to take away from this particular webinar is number one, have patience with yourself when it comes to using ultrasound for guided cannulation. This takes time. Acknowledge the time that you do have and use it effectively when it comes to the ultrasound. Do your best, whether you're the bedside nurse or the educator rolling out this new skill set, to create an environment that is conducive to learning. Recognize your stress levels, recognize how you're talking to your peers and to, your, to your, the individuals that you might be teaching. Recognize when it's time to teach the theory and when it's time to coach. You'll notice that previously I was talking about when you present at the bedside to help somebody, it's always worthwhile to ask them, what is it that you want from me? Do you want me to stand back and not say anything? Do you want me to correct maneuvers that I see as being not quite right? Or do you want me to coach you and tell you next steps the whole time I'm going through it? What I usually do when I'm introducing ultrasound to a new staff member is uh, I have them uh, do all of the virtual education, try some simulation, and then at the bedside, they pick the cannulation sites. I do the first cannulation, talking the whole time what I'm doing, what I'm doing, I hand it off to them and I stand over their shoulder and I repeat the process talking about what you're doing. They find that after a few of those um, going forward, then what I would do is I present at the bedside and coach, just talk over the shoulder. Okay, now you're going to this, now you're going to that. Now, why don't you try this? And I've gotten feedback that that is helpful. But getting feedback from your learners and providing feedback from the, to the people teaching you is only going to help enhance your education program. If you don't know what you're looking at, learn how to capture an image or a clip on your ultrasound so you can discuss that particular case at a later date. It's always worthwhile not to give up when you don't know, but to ask why, what, what is this? What are we doing next? What are the next steps? So I would like to say thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you uh, joining me in this webinar and I hope that I've provided you with some information that can be helpful to you. Um, Ultrasound guided cannulation in the hemodialysis unit is my passion, and I will continue to try to learn as much as I can about this. And uh, thank you again for your time. And I guess now we're going to answer any potential questions that would be out there. Yep, that's correct. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Looks like we've got a few coming in already. Uh, one that came in earlier uh, was talking about the Doppler colors. Uh, so it says, hi, Adrian, with Doppler colors, what if I'm only seeing red or only blue? No mixing. Oh, well, then you know what? You can almost assume that in that particular access, you've got the blood flowing in one direction. And usually it, it is because that particular access has lower access flows. So we all know the average access flow that we like to see is about 600 milliliters per minute. Sometimes with the older individuals, lower blood pressures, a little bit dehydrated, they might have lower flows. And if that's the case, you might just see the one color because the blood is very calmly flowing up that vessel. You might see the dual colors when you have a higher flow upper arm access. So that might be the reason why you're seeing one or the other. No matter what, color is a good thing. It means the vessel's patent. And there's one that says, uh, is the ultrasound the same one used for pick lines? Yes, it is. A lot of times in a lot of facilities, the nurses use ultrasound to insert pick lines and it's nurses who put them in. It absolutely is. To some degree, all ultrasounds are the same, but the probes allow you to use them for different things. So in um, pick line insertion, they tend to use the vascular or a linear probe, which is the same one we use when we use it for guided cannulation in the dialysis unit. 
Awesome. Uh, anybody else have any other questions? Uh, here's one. Uh, one thing that I've noticed recently since we've started using a more rapid access graphs. You often can't see color flow in a newly placed AV graft. I was told it's because air gets into the area around the graft and takes time for it to dissolve. And of course the ultrasound can't see through air. Do you find this happens for you as well? So I believe you're talking about things like the flexine graft or something. The ones that can be cannulated one or two days after a surgical creation. And yes, Color Doppler doesn't allow us to determine flows, but what does allow you to determine patency is the fact that you don't see any thrombus, you see black. And I have experienced that even in my limited contact with those types of graphs. And uh, let me tell you, we absolutely use ultrasound when we're cannulating those because you do not want to miss an interstitial event leaking into the surrounding tissues can make her break that particular graft on a go forward. So yeah, Doppler is not used in those circumstances for that reason. Hey, Chris, I can go ahead and take that last one here. Um, sure. We have a question about if you do you mind using these webinars to teach our teams? Um, this webinar will be posted on our Behind the Scan webinar page that you can see on this uh, slide right now. And you are absolutely wel welcome to play that webinar for your teams. Uh, looks like uh, we just got a couple more thank yous here. So it uh, looks like that's it for the questions. I want to thank Adrian for coming by and doing a great job talking about uh, this cannulation topic. Hopefully everybody learned a whole lot. And if you'd like to uh, see this later on again, you can go to the Behind the Scan webinar link that's down there. And we thank you all for joining us.